creation has an obligation to God. God has made us. He's made the world we live in. He's made <clears throat> things as they are. He's given us good things to enjoy. Every human being on the face of the planet has an obligation to God. And seeing his grace and seeing what he's provided for us in Christ and seeing the mercy and the forgiveness that's there for all that we have done that flies in his face, that throws things in his face, there's a moral obligation to turn to God who's been so good. To leave behind the things that cause the wreckage in the world and that cause the wreckage in our lives and to turn to him. There's a moral obligation on everybody, but Paul is writing particularly here to believers at this point. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we above all, who have experienced this mercy and grace and know the Spirit of God working within us, wrestling against the power of the flesh, we have a moral obligation. That obligation is not to the flesh. So we've got the ob observation, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. And the interpretation then is this, it is not to the flesh to live according to it. Now that's a revolutionary sort of thought. Two ways of looking at this. Firstly, our sinful human nature tells us we simply can't help it. We have to behave like this because it is natural and inevitable. Paul is saying utter nonsense. You don't have to listen to that. We owe this sinful human nature that is talking to us and telling us we have to be like this because it's us. Because there's nothing we can do about it. We owe it no obligation. Now that's incredibly relevant to things that are tearing up our society at the moment. Tearing up the church in our age and are about to bring the wrath of the, the state down on the church that stands out against that view. In all probability. Our society thrives on the idea that we are obliged to live according to our, our human flesh, our sinful human nature. That's what it says to us. That's what it publicises. That's what it makes a virtue of. I can't help it. It's the way I am. I have to do this. This is me. I am this. I ought to do it. That's underlying a lot of what we hear. It's wrong to say this is wrong because this is me. We have a moral obligation. But it is a devilish perversion of thought to say that our moral obligation is to do what our flesh tells us to do. And yet that's where our society is just at this point in time. We have no moral obligation to live according to our flesh, says the Apostle Paul. None. And Paul is speaking here to believers who should have realised this, but are living in the midst of a society that shows a great deal of permissiveness in Rome to the same sort of things that our society does. It's a parallel background and context. Paul is speaking to believers who should have realised we have no obligation to our flesh to live according to it. But, but see, I'm persuaded there's something else going on here too, especially in the light of chapter 7. We aren't obliged to keep this moral obligation to the flesh, nor in the way of the flesh. It says to live according to the flesh. Paul's previous Phariseeism taught him to deal with his flesh in the power of the flesh according to the flesh. It was a legal way of looking at life. It was a legalism, blatantly, obviously, plainly. We are obliged to keep this moral obligation, walking by grace and in step with the Spirit. Galatians 3, the passage that we've been looking at, and self-control is the fruit of the Spirit comes from, is showing us that we need to live according to the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. There's a, a, a sinful world of difference between these two approaches to, a, to inside church moral obligation. Do we wrestle with our sin according to the power and strength of our flesh? Or are we going to do this in the way of the Spirit, by grace, by the Gospel? Brothers and sisters, we've got an obligation, but it's not by the flesh, not to the flesh. Neither is it to, to deal with the flesh according to the flesh, but in the strength and in the power of God. And that's what Romans 7 has been telling us and showing us. Does that make sense? It's to be done with the, with the weapons of warfare that God puts in our hands, not the ones that we can manage to dream up and think of ourselves. There's a stomping great reason we've really got to get this right, but, but get the point to start with. 
The difference between Luther became, before he became a Christian and after he became a Christian is the way that he deals with his sinful flesh. He was, a, he was against sin before he was a Christian. The way that John Newton talks about his previous way of life and dealing with sin and so on, massively different before he was a Christian and after he was a Christian. Before dealing with his weakness and failure in the power of his human flesh and afterwards by the grace of God and the power of Christ, by the Spirit of God. Same with John Wesley. All those folk who were associated with the Holy Club in Oxford in those early days, you know, they were very serious about mortifying their own sin in their strength by, by external means, by the power of their flesh. But then, walking down Aldersgate Street, that important day, he met with God. He felt his heart strangely warmed. He felt as if he did trust Christ to be his saviour. And then his attitude and his way of dealing with his negativity. It was utterly different. Now by the grace of God and the power of the gospel, by God's grace, dealing with his sin. We have an obligation. Yeah, we do. Any religious person will tell you that. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. So that's what a Christian will tell you. We don't deal with it according to the flesh. We don't with the observation. Brothers and sisters, you have an obligation. We dealt with the interpretation. That obligation is not to the flesh, to live according to it. And now there are two really important revelations. Revelations. Two pieces of biblical revelation elucidate Paul's point. Firstly, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now that's a word against religiosity as much as it's a word against immorality. If you live according to the flesh, mortifying your flesh by, you know, fleshly means and all that stuff, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, just saying, it's me, oh, it's the way I am, I do it, it's, it's, it's my integrity, I ought to do this because I am like this, then you will die. We know biblically, and also from the context of Romans 3, where this argument stems from, Romans 3, 2.3.23 goes for it. Like this, it describes idolatry and its product, which is immorality, in chapter 1 of Romans. Then it describes religion and its product, which is self-righteousness and hypocrisy, in chapters 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. And both of those characterise our times, both immorality and self-righteousness. And then it describes the point which couldn't get made any clearly that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God whether they're religiously or immor immorally was that going to get you and I've justified freely by his grace by the redemption that comes through Christ Jesus all have sinned all are put right one way was that going to get you Romans 6 23 the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord everyone religious immoral whatever they are they do this by nature. And if you carry on living with that mindset, you will die. It's exactly the point that's reiterated here in Romans 8. There's the warning. We live under moral obligation. It isn't to the flesh to obey the flesh. And the warning that goes with it is stark. Just go on the way you're going and you'll die. No reprieve. But there's a promise revealed that runs alongside this very stark revelation. It's the second revelation. The first revelation is by way of warning. The second revelation is by way of promise. If by the Spirit, says Romans 8.13, you put to death the desires of the body, the desires of the flesh, you will live. If you deal with it by the Spirit, you live. If you deal with it by the flesh, forget it. Flesh fighting flesh, devil throw out devil, no. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Mm -hmm.